I'm privileged today to have as my guest, uh, Dr. Gary Habermas, a world-class expert on the historical, philosophical, and theological issues surrounding the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he speaks a little bit about his work, and so I'm excited for that. And so let's just stay tuned for our chat with Dr. Habermas. Well, despite my little glitch there at the beginning, that <laughs> here we are. And so we've been chatting behind the scenes for a little bit and having a good conversation. Uh, Dr. Habermas, uh, tell me, you just sent your, um, your first volume to the publisher, or you, you're kind of wrapping that up, of your magnum opus on uh, Christ resurrection. Tell us a little bit about your work. Well... It's a long, long story, but very briefly, uh, I started, I did my doctoral dissertation on the resurrection way back in 1976. And in the 1990s, I just thought to myself, wow, I've let the subject go. And I give a lot of lectures, but I haven't done too much professionally. So I need to go back and start updating my bibliography. Now, mm -hmm. I, I always keep up on stuff in the resurrection, but I thought I got to be more systematic. So in the mid-90s, I started this effort to get everything out there and to to look it over. Uh, a lot of it's in German and French, and of course, most is English. And I started putting a document together, just simply not my reacting to people, but just what's being said about the resurrection, over 140 different subtopics. Well, this uh -huh. document very quickly grew and it's about 1500 pages today well wow. then my friend started telling me um you can use that document in your research but don't keep us in the dark uh give us something to remember you by when you're no longer in this world you don't want that <laughs> as one guy said to me you mm -hmm. don't want this information to die with you and that was a stunning one-liner mm -hmm. to me you don't want it to die with you. And and no, I don't. I want it to go for ministry. And so I started writing this uh, on the resurrection about 19, uh, I mean, 2013, I started. So it's been nine years. I've got four volumes, more or less ready to go. But everyone has to be edited because when you do things 10 years ago, you got to update them for, hey, your last book is 2013. Haven't you read anything newer than that? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so updating. And the, and the first volume is on evidence, evidence for the resurrection. And it uh, was about 1,300 pages long. And it went to the publishers six weeks ago. And yeah. of that six out of that 1300 pages on evidence half the book is on the minimal facts argument wow wow yeah i'm sorry i i cut you off there <laughs> that's right i i thought i had all the buttons set up and and uh, yeah, you did I, you had and, the button just right <laughs> no i, <laughs> I no, I'm just kidding. all right so you were talking about the minimal facts argument i will not yeah. cut to that scene again but uh, go right. ahead I'll, I'll just go right back to it so the first volume is data evidence alone and half the book 600 of the 1300 ish pages is on the minimal facts and how mm -hmm. why is it that virtually no critical scholars no matter whether they're uh, believers, moderates, or liberals, or atheists or agnostics, why they don't deny this material. And and the list I have, they're not separate arguments, but arguments and or considerations. Yeah. There are over a hundred points on just these six facts, on just wow. these six facts wow. that I use, over a hundred. That's why nobody disputes them. And I wanted to get it out there. So right now it's in the hands of the publishers. Second mm -hmm. volume, doing right now. Um, I'll introduce this way. Of all the treatments on the resurrection today, uh, only one book has more than 100 pages on naturalistic theories. You know, critics can suppose this, 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 and this. What do yeah. we say? 
only one book has more than 100 pages, and that's Mike Lacona's long book on the resurrection of Jesus, published by IVP Academic. Great book. Best mm -hmm. book out there right now, I think. And Mike's got about 250 pages on on naturalistic theories. Then Mike's in my book on the case for the resurrection is next. That's like 100. And then there's a really old book from 1908 that has 100 pages. But the second volume is totally on naturalistic theories, and it's 1,100 pages. Wow. Wow. I cover about everything you can cover with 8, 10, 12 refutations of each one. So I do that. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to say, well, it's overkill. But I do so many refutations because if you're reading it or someone else is reading it, your four best critiques are not going to be the same as the next apologist who reads it. He'll have a different four than you. And I think every to each his own, everybody can pick the arguments that are good and refute whatever they come up with. So that, that's the next yeah. one. Yeah. The third one, the third volume, which is 1,500 pages where scholarship is. And the fourth volume uh, is on how is the resurrection applicable to worldview, ministry, ethics, doubt, meeting people's pastoral needs. So that's yeah. volume four. Right now mm -hmm. we're talking four volumes of between 750 and 1,100 pages each. Wow. So there's going to be four very large hardcover version, uh, hardcover volumes. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and, and I'm sure that many are, uh, many who are watching know or understand the um, the concept or the argument of the minimal facts. But probably that you know, for some folks that they don't even know what you're talking about there. So just give us a quick overview of uh, what this argument is. Sure. Well, to say it in like one minute. The way the argument works is I take facts that have two characteristics. The most important fact by far is that they're multiply evidenced by many different evidences. There's probably an average of 12 to 15 evidences for each of the facts. And when I say 12 to 15 evidences, evidence is the way critics do the evidencing. I don't say mm. it's true because here's the verse and everybody agrees with me and this verse is good because critics are going to say, yeah, I don't like that verse. So the, the second criterion is the facts are so good. There's so many good arguments that virtually every critic writing, even atheistic New Testament scholars like uh, uh, Garrett Ludeman, who unfortunately just pa passed away this last year, about a year ago this month, I think. Mm -hmm. Garrett Ludeman, Art Ehrman, atheistic New Testament scholars, agnostic New Testament scholars, skeptics, they will grant the same facts. And so in a sentence... I take facts that are the best attested and also agreed to by the vast majority of scholars. And I say, you can show the resurrection happened with these facts alone. Wow. Wow. You, you want a list of the, the six facts I use? Of course I do. <laughs> do. Okay. Well, I can do that pretty quickly. Number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Yeah. Number two, the disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. They thought they saw Jesus. Mm -hmm. Number three, they started proclaiming it uh, immediately. The, we now know that the earliest proclamation went out in the 30s AD, and uh, some scholars think the earliest reports. It, well, the book of Acts said it took 50 days, Pentecost, for that first sermon to go out. Uh, yeah. That's about that, that's pretty consistent. And these facts went out immediately, very quick, early uh, reports. Four, their lives were transformed mm -hmm. from people who were willing to die for their faith. And then five and six, you've got two skeptics who were unbelievers before they met the risen Jesus, as far as we know, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, who became mm -hmm. believers. And uh, as Bart Ehrman says, turned the world upside down. Bart Ehrman says, it's not the resurrection that founded Christianity. It's the proclamation of the resurrection. And once the disciples started this, I love the phrase, once mm -hmm. the disciples started preaching this, they turned the world on its ear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's from an atheistic New Testament scholar. So, so put the cookies on the lower shelf for someone like me. Is that why is this argument so significant? Because you can't get away from it. I mean, it, it's it's very hard to argue against. Mm -hmm. And one reviewer of an article I did years ago, an essay, one reviewer, a philosopher, said, the minimal facts reduces the boulders 
behind which skeptics hide with their critiques of the resurrection. And one by one, the boulders are removed, leaving them with not very many comebacks against the resurrection. Yeah, so yeah. on the one hand, it the facts support the resurrection. On the other hand, it critiques the critics' uh, theories of, yeah. as to why it didn't happen. Yeah, so yeah. It, I think it's a very effective tool. What One apologist, I should say, this person is not a great fan of the minimal facts. They don't think it's they don't think it's horrible or anything, but they just think you need a broader basis and we need to do reliability mm -hmm. in a bigger frame. But this person, being a critic, says that the minimal facts argument is the most widely used argument in apologetics today, and it's probably used in the high ninety percentile by Christians who are witnessing to their college and other friends. So it's a mm -hmm. um, it's a ready-made argument that can be gone through quickly and ends up with, here's the gospel, how are you going to deny it? Kind yeah. Of thing. yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you that question. Why do people deny it? Well, and, and you know what, Carrie, that is probably the number one question I get. If yeah. this argument is so good, yeah, and the atheist New Testament scholars agree with it, yeah, and Jewish New Testament scholars agree with it, yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, how come they don't all fall on their knees and confess Christ? Yeah. Because faith is, doubt is another subject I do a lot with. And most people who doubt, doubt for emotional reasons, not factual reasons. Mm -hmm. I think most of us are run by our worldviews, not by our factual look at the world. If I know yeah. a candidate is running for office, and he, this person might win, but I'm from the other party. To be frank, I can't stand him before I even hear a first sentence out of his mouth because yeah. my worldview says he's coming from the wrong angle. So if that political example is an example, mm -hmm. we all evaluate data by where we're coming from or where the other person is coming from, not by whether that guy has the best facts. Of course he can't have the best facts. He's in the wrong party. So <laughs> the reason I think most people don't don't bow a knee to Christ is because they've got other things in their mind. They've got a worldview. They've got the, the things that the world has to offer, you know, the three of the big ones, money, sex, and power. Yeah. Uh, that's that's an allure that for most people, mm -hmm. uh, religion can't can't light a candle to it. Mm -hmm. They're not interested. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. People who don't come choose not to come. So, you know, that that's the bottom line to me. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's a contest of wills. It's either uh, him or me. And, yeah. and, and, and most of us, most of us uh, opt for me. And... You know, yeah, that's very important. Yeah, yeah. I th I think a lot of it too is that we have a a fundamental picture of God that He's the the great uh, depriver, and so in other words, if I if I follow Christ, if I turn my life over to God, He's going to take away from me all the stuff that's going to make my life worthwhile. You know, I think you're right. You know, I think you're right. That's a big fear, and th therefore, we know how hot certain push button topics are in the society today like abortion or mm -hmm. or um uh free speech yeah and where whenever you state your view it could be as short as a sentence when you state your view you're gonna have a lot of lovers and a lot of haters automatically mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. that's true of the christian message for sure yeah yeah that's for sure so how about um what are the biggest objections that you've come up against for people who, uh, I, I guess, reject the minimal facts argument. What one or two big objections do they uh, they offer? Well, here's what they don't say. They don't say one of your facts is wrong. Hmm. Hmm. And let me tell you why. I've I've dialogued with so many critics, agnostic New Testament scholars, uh, Jewish scholars, uh, uh, and so on they often start the dialogue and the moderator will put the six facts out there and time and again the person will say yep i'm good with them let's start hmm. and so they assume the facts and they move on hmm. and so i'd say the number one objection is not about the six facts but it goes like this you christians 
want me to believe in two worlds, this world and the supernatural world. But the supernatural world is a storybook rule, world. It's an animated world. It's a world that some people sing about, but it's not a world that we see. It's not a world we know about. So you've got a harder job than I do because I, I only talk about the world I live in and work in. You've got to show me the other world exists too. Uh, you mm -hmm. have to give me, in other words, it's a worldview question. And I'll, when they yeah. do that, I'll say, I'll go, time out. Have you ever heard of near-death experiences? Mm -hmm. Now, I had one of the best-known skeptics in the world. I mean, if I told you the name, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but this guy's probably in the top five names everybody knows. Yeah. And, and the person, when I said that in the debate, mm -hmm. he said, I don't want to talk about near-death experiences. Hmm. And I said, I guess you don't. And, and here's my argument. There are over 300, I publish widely on this with secular audiences, and there are over 300 ev highly evidential cases of near-death experiences. And there are dozens of cases where a person has no measurable brain or heart activity, mm -hmm. and they report facts from, let's say, two blocks away that can be verified by a police report or by a photograph or by something else. But they were out during that time with no a brain or heart. So what what happened to their mind? And when they look down and the and the doctor's doing CPR and they think he's beating on their chest and the person <laughs> screams at the doctor, "Let me go, let me go. You have no right to beat on my chest. This is really I'm ha I'm happy where I am. Let me go." The funny mm -hmm. thing is nobody looks up at that person over the bed where they think they are and says, "Would you be quiet so I could do my work?" They don't know him. They're, <laughs> they're already they're already in another universe. Yeah. Uh, I saw I saw one a one cartoon, a one, uh, you know, picture joke mm -hmm. years ago where the doctor was working on somebody and the spirit, the person's spirit was up above him. Mm -hmm. And the doctor looks up at him and says, are you going to come back down here or do I, do I pronounce you dead? Which is, <laughs> which is quite funny. But the point is NDEs, evidential NDEs are neutral. They're not religious. They're not religious worldview oriented. Yeah. They don't yeah. say one belief is true or false, but they do say there's another world. So mm -hmm. my answer to the other world objection is NDEs tell you about another world. And wow, NDEs not only tell you about another world, they tell you about afterlife. And I'm here to talk to you today about afterlife, Jesus's. Mm -hmm. so it's not just another world. It's on the same subject, life after death. So that's how I answer that question. And and I'll be glad for them to refute the the on the to go after the minimal facts, which they don't. Mm -hmm. I'd be glad for them to try to disprove the NDE, NDE evidential cases, which they don't. Mm -hmm. So if you've got those two, it seems to me we've got a pretty rock solid starting place about there's this world and there's other world. And are you ready for the other world? And and that's the evidence for the resurrection. So yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's, it sounds to me like it's a, a matter of confirmation bias. In other words, I've made up my mind that this can't be true. And so the evidence has to fit my preconceptions. That's right. Yeah. Just take the political example. Let's say you've done a poll. It's an objective poll. And your poll says I'm wrong. And a vast majority of people don't like my view. Mm -hmm. But if I don't like your view, that doesn't make me shout any less. I might shout more <laughs> because you think you have a majority of people on your side. Yeah. And yeah. so in other words, you could actually make people angrier that they don't have a good responses mm -hmm. uh, and they go away. I, Greg Kokel, the, the Christian apologist, he, he makes yeah. a really good comment. He says, I say to people all the time, I'm not trying to convert you. I'm trying to put a stone in your shoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that one liner. It's just sort of like, a, well, hey, look, you're a good guy. Uh, think about it. I'll chat again over a cup of coffee with you another time. But uh, just just think about it, and you leave them like that. And I think that's all we can do many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, maybe some of our viewers have never heard of Dr. Gary Habermas, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm I'm sure that uh, that uh, there are a few people out there like that. But just for the sake of helping them to understand that you know what you're talking about, and uh, tell us a little bit about your credentials. Um, you know, why should we even listen to this guy? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Well, I've I've uh, I've been a college professor for uh, let me count now, um, forty six years, hmm. and. I started with bachelor's degree. I went to master's and now I'm full-time as a PhD professor. My PhD is from Michigan State University and my dissertation was on the resurrection. Half of my committee thought the resurrection happened and half of my committee thought it was wrong. Uh, the, I had to satisfy three departments at Michigan State, the history department, the philosophy department and the religion department. The guy who represented the history department was a Jewish professor of history. Wow. And the neat thing about him was he was not only very helpful with the research, but he was probably the most complimentary fellow of my dissertation. Hmm. And, hmm. and uh, so that's where I started. And I kind of got the ball rolling for the minimal facts in that dissertation, which was published, which was finished in uh, 76. And I've been developing it ever since with um, 20 something, ab about half of my my 40 whatever books are uh, on the resurrection of Jesus. So I've just been developing that idea ever since that dissertation in 76. And that's that's what be, what's behind this magnum opus. I should say of all those publications on the resurrection, they are not summarized in this new work. The new work makes virtually no use of anything I've ever published. In fact, I don't cite myself mm -hmm. as a general rule. Uh, I don't use other material. I don't reproduce chapters and books as chapters in this book. It, it's all right now it's 5,300 pages on the resurrection. And I would say it's 95% new material. Wow. 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 You've been all over the world speaking on this topic that, um, and you're in high demand. We've talked a little bit about that. <laughs> we talked a little bit about that before the broadcast is that people are always after you uh, to do interviews and all. And so I genuinely appreciate you taking some time with me today uh, to um, talk a little bit about this. No, that, I'm enjoying um, it. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> you know? So um, how about for you? Um, what's the next step for you? Finishing volume two. <laughs> it, it, professionally, besides three hours of email a day and, and li literally 80 hours minimum a week, hmm. um, my big, my number one push is to get volume two ready for the publisher. And the, the emails and things that come up and uh, we talk to me about this and we answer these questions so many of them come up that there are days and days where I don't get back to the manuscript. And that's bothersome because I want to help people when they contact me, but I also want to help people bring this, these books out. So yeah. that's a day in my life. I'm in my, my wife will tell you, I'm in the study 24 yeah. seven. She goes to bed early, thankfully. So I don't feel like I'm when I'm um, I don't feel like I'm cheating or when, when I don't come up, I don't get off my computer usually till 12 or one in the morning. Wow. Uh, 12 wow. Or 1 AM. And I call it a day and watch ESPN for an hour and go to sleep. Yeah. yeah. So. You mentioned that you, um, that you um, do a lot of research, but also when we were talking, you said you really have a heart and and that's one of the things, by the way, I'm just going to say uh, out loud because I, you know, I'm really impressed by your heart for ministry because number one, taking time for a guy like me, but number two, there are a number of other um, things that you do. And one of those is that you spend a lot of time with, uh, what is it, high schoolers and junior hires, uh, like once a year. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, every year I go to a local Christian high school and they call it an apologetics day. They've got a fantastic Bible faculty. One of their professors has a PhD. Uh, so, I mean, at the high school level, that's that's pretty noticeable. And they dismiss their classes. And I get a, a, a ninth, ninth through 12th grade. Now, it's not like ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th. All the classes are intermixed, depending yeah, on yeah. With, with age, age groups. And uh, it's a it's a large Christian high school. And the class the classes are fairly full when they come in. And we spend all day talking about a topic that their faculty chooses ahead of time. 
Mm -hmm. And usually we either do resurrection all day long and tell them how to use the minimal facts argument to respond, or we talk about doubt because we know that young people their age, the most common age, according to, to uh, surveys, the most common age to be a doubter is between 13 and 35. Yeah. And strangely enough, the older you get, if you know what you believe and what, why you believe, we're not talking about just anybody in the street, but mm -hmm. the older you get, the fewer people doubt. It's, hmm. it's amazing. You think hmm. the other way around. Hmm. Oh, no, you're closer to death. You're probably scared to death of death. You know, uh, no. On this, on this one major survey with thousands of adults, the those who were in their 80s, I think the doubt rate was 2%. Wow. Huh. As opposed to a much, much, much higher percent of teens, 20s, and early 30s. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what um, what type of questions are those kids asking you? I mean, obviously, you have your content that you're sharing, but uh, right. and, and I suppose that there's times when there's open mic and they have an opportunity to ask questions. What type of things are they concerned about? Well, <laughs> they could be all over the map. It could be mm -hmm. about what I think about a news item. Um, they come up after class is over and. One one gal recently told me she she was a senior and she was going to nursing school next year. And we've got four nurses in our family. So I was listening to her and what she wants to study. And she had her life planned out and she was a senior in high school. It's pretty cool. But sometimes they have questions about doubt mm -hmm. and they'll say things like, well, if the evidence is so good, how come God answers Bill's prayers but doesn't answer my prayers? You know, yeah. you get those sort of things. Why is God silent? Mm -hmm. Um a lot of that kind of stuff. I, I all my with all my heart, I want God to talk to me, and I can't get Him to talk. Mm -hmm. What should I think about that or say about that in light of the facts on the resurrection? Why would He? And when they would say to me, I, I had a woman write to me recently, and she was in great pain, and she said, "I'm a Christian, but now I'm barely holding on, and I'm fifty-fifty about staying." And she says, there's a lot of pain in my life. Why would God let their child go through this? And I said, well, let me yeah. ask you a question. Why didn't the father answer the son's question? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. Jesus had just gone through the roughest, maybe the most horrible death in the universe. And God didn't take him off the cross. Yeah, and yet yeah. two verses in the book of Hebrews astoundingly say, that Jesus learned obedience through his suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's hard to take. Jesus had to learn obedience. Then, so I ask crowds. I'll say, "Do you learn faster than Jesus, or are you <laughs> are you more obedient than Jesus? What is it? Why should you not have to go through it?" Yeah, yeah. Because you know, some I'm... people, say, you know, e evils evils a very good taskmaster. It really it makes us sort of learn. It is. And you know, that's the kind of question I usually get. Not too much discuss, not too much critiquing the resurrection. Just so, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah, gotcha. You know, um, and forgive me if I'm out of bounds. You can, uh, uh, you said that no question was out of bounds, so I'm going to just ask that's you right. straight up: <laughs> Is that uh, sure. you went you went through a season in your own yeah. life of um, of great personal suffering? Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. In fact, I've only realized recently, Carrie, that that my doubt lasted 10 straight years and off and on for 10 more years. So I went through it for 20 years and I, in my mind, I begged, I wished somebody who knew way, 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 way more than I did would come up to me and say, OK, look. You're trying to argue A, B, C, D. Let me give you the schematic. It's A, mm -hmm. C, D, e, F, G. And now when you have this, you have the truth of the gospel and you have a decision to make about Jesus. And I wish somebody could have talked me through it and answer my questions. Yeah. And there was nobody there. And I was resentful toward God. And I thought God wasn't listening. And I came very close to leaving the faith, very close. And... um. Yeah, that plagued my life. But I realized years later, my doubt was bookended by two deaths of the two most important people to me in my life. One got me started answering the questions, start asking the questions at the beginning. 
And the other one, my doubt finished maybe five years before my wife and mother of my four children and best friend in the world uh, died of stomach cancer. Mm -hmm. So two deaths bookended my doubt. And of course, it's emotional circumstances like that that cause many people to go on their pilgrimage. Most doubt, as I've said, most doubt is emotional. It's not factual. Mm -hmm. It's emotional. Mm -hmm. And when you get really emotional about something, it's hard to talk that person down with facts alone. You need to yeah. tell them what to do with their unwieldy emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have a kind of a working hypothesis and I mean that that the um that the um the course of people's skepticism is launched by unresolved um, doubt uh, where God failed them, where it, it seems like God failed them. Didn't he didn't heal grandma? He didn't, you know, uh, stop their uh, the family from having a divorce or whatever. You know, you, you can go through a million different things, and then sure. you know, and you pray with all sincerity and you bargain with God and you make all these promises of what you're going to do, and then you get silent. Actually, not just silence. Things actually turn out to be your worst nightmare, and um, you know, and so uh, it seems to me that that's kind of the path that people. That, that, that's it the does. trigger, you know. And they have this sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And no one's there to tell them, look this way or that way. Like I said, no one's there to ask them the question, well, if it's that simple, if your suffering is that simple, why didn't God take his son down from the cross? Why yeah. didn't he answer his prayer? Um, they need people to speak into their lives that way. But once you get somebody who's cross at god mm -hmm. it they often go that way and then they've got buddies at school who talk them back onto the ledge again you know and yeah. and think it's great for us to have a lot of angst and you need to get away from your christianity i've wondered when when you're going to wake up in smaller roses anyway and and there's always people willing to welcome them to the other side uh whatever that may be so uh, mm -hmm. i think that's the world we live in and i'll tell you what I just heard an announcement to, on the news today that the administration or somebody in the administration has said to expect a summer of violence in this mm. country. Mm. And if that's the if that's the world we live in, yeah. we should not be surprised when that's all we're about and we wonder where God is. That's a normal question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I and and here's here's how I see the tandem on this, okay? That I see that that trauma or tragedy oftentimes is the trigger, and then indulgence or sin is what keeps us uh, stuck in a place where you know God, you know that um, I'm not interested, as the scriptures tell us that there's pleasure in sin for a season. And if anybody hasn't figured that out, they haven't done enough research, you know, because there's enough there's enough pleasure there to keep you hooked, you know. Kerry, I think you're right. That's a good one-two punch. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what did you say? Problems and then indulgence. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, uh, trauma is the trigger, and then trauma. Yeah, and then um, you know, um, indulgence is uh, the hook that keeps us there. You know, I think you're right. I think that's a I think that's a brilliant insight. I think that's often the way it goes. And uh, we found that I've got a clinical psychologist buddy who gave passed out a bunch of tests to check some of my theories on how to answer doubt. And mm -hmm. he asked questions and uh, what loads most frequently on doubt is uh, on the most common kind of doubt is number one, anxiety. Number mm -hmm. two, depression. Mm -hmm. And of course, depression is tightly correlated with anger. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. anxiety, depression, anger, those are the kind of emotions mm -hmm. that follow this these kind of problems. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know, you know, I'm a, I'm a doubter myself. That's a, yeah, I, I, extreme doubt you know, before I became a Christian and persistent doubt after I became a Christian. And I know that a lot of it is tied to um, an anxiety disorder I have, and that um, 
And, you know, why doesn't God clear up this stuff and make it easier for me to be a believer? You know, right. But, yeah. you know, Carrie, along that line, this is the factual. It doesn't answer all the emotional questions, but a factual line. I often start my lectures on doubt Mm -hmm. or my lectures on the resurrection by saying the following sentence. I'll say, uh, you Christians here, non-Christians may come up and ask you a lot of questions. And they might make you feel silly because you don't know the answers to all the questions about creation or genocide in the Old Testament yeah, or what's yeah, the future, yeah, yeah, yeah. what the future look like, what political party do you belong to? They they ask mm-hmm. tough questions, and I tell them, if you master the data for the resurrection, and I'm prejudiced, I think the minimal facts is the shortest, quickest, deepest way yeah. to master the material for the resurrection. So I'll say, if the resurrection happened. Christianity is true. To me, that's the simplest way to narrow it down. You don't have to be, we don't, I don't, nobody has to be the one that gives the final answer on creation, genocide, (laughs) the future, political parties. And and when we're in a worried, worked up world, we could be thinking about the resurrection, knowing that's a key. But if we can't answer the problem of genocide in the Old Testament, now we're in a quandary from that one. And I tell people, straighten out the, the deity, the, the whenever the gospel is defined in the New Testament, you're talking about the God side of the data. We're talking about the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus are solid and you're walking with the Lord, nobody has to nominate you to answer all these other questions. If you know Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross, your sins rose from the dead. If you believe that's true and you, you're walking with him, that's it. It would be really convenient if I can answer all the world's tough questions, but that's mm-hmm. the only one I have to know to be factually at rest. There you go. There you go. Hey, you know, we're almost out of time. And by the way, let me just encourage you, and I appreciate you spending time with me, but you know, stick around once I sign off on the uh, the um, broadcast. But... um. But uh, uh, before we wrap things up, what additional thoughts uh, would you like to share? I think you've covered it very well, Carrie. To me, there's two sides, two major sides to this. And you said, uh, you know, trauma and then giving in to our... our um, Indulgences, it, yeah. Our indulgences. I, I, I think that's a very good look at it. I would say to the person to settle the issue of the resurrection in their mind. And if it's true, ask themselves why they shouldn't believe because eternal life is hanging to the balances. And I would say what's on the other side of death is far more exciting than what's on this side of death. And (laughs) if that's, if that's eternity, if Christians are right about this and that's eternity, we would be silly. You, You know, we tell people you work 40 years to save up for retirement. Yeah. All right, here's my question. How hard and how long are you willing to work to save up for eternity? Yeah. I, I think that, you know, we don't come to Christ by good works, but once you become a Christian, I really do believe the sentence that what you do with Christ after salvation determines the capacity to which you will enjoy eternity. You know, mm-hmm. there's gonna be a lot of people in heaven who have half full cups, and there's going to be a lot of people in heaven with 90% full cups. I'm just kind of feeling that the 90 percenters have more enjoyment. Now, the half full cup people are totally happy. Yeah. But the 90 percenters can do more, observe more, learn yeah. more. I, I I think sanctification goes on after death. I think we continue mm-hmm. to grow. And I think yeah. if we don't send anything to our heavenly account, if we don't put anything up in the bank, the heavenly bank early, we're missing out. I like Randy Elkhorn's stuff about what are you doing for eternity, and if you if you're not if you're not sending things to your heavenly account, uh, you're missing something. And I think Amen. the best way to do that is to care for other people, to love them deeply, without without an idea of of what the results have to be. Leave those to the Lord, but to be about ministry and to think about what people are going through and try to be there for them, and tell them at the resurrection if they can settle that, they have no no right to doubt. Really, yeah. if that's yeah. true, yeah. you know, yeah. so I, that's the way I go about it. I, I give them the facts. I tell them you really can't deny them in my estimation. 
And, uh, you know, if you're a believer, what are you going to do towards eternity with this this material? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate that. It's been a wonderful experience. And as I told you a little bit earlier, is that uh, that you're one of my favorite people to interview. <laughs> you know, I just appreciate your life and your witness. And if you got a story to share, then let's talk. You can connect with me at uh, this link at uh, reignite.taplink.ws. And, uh, you know, we have a chance to, um, uh, to visit a little bit. This has just been a wonderful time for me, and I hope that you've been blessed by it, despite the few technological hiccups we've had along the way. And so that's it for now. God bless you.